Hi, my name is Mohammed Sadri and I have been a PhD student in University of Bologna in Italy and soon I will be a postdoctoral researcher at TU Kaiserslautern in Germany. I have been working with FPGA devices for more than 10 years and recently I have focused on the Xilinx Zinc device and so I have decided to transfer my knowledge about how you can design various types of embedded systems with Xilinx Zinc device to other people. To begin this series of videos I have decided first to focus on a very basic concept connectivity. In fact I have decided to focus and to answer this question that how different modules inside your embedded system will talk to each other. So we begin by answering this question. What is Axi and what are Axi interfaces? If you learn this con concept well, then using this concept you will be able to design your embedded system and to create it in a very short amount of time. And it is the very basic concept that you should know before you can be really able to use the Vivado Xilinx design environment efficiently. So this is a kind of primary step that should be passed before getting into Vivado and creating real serious designs using the Vivado environment. The problem, the basic problem is that if you look at a chip in the market, in the today's market, you can see that these chips contain a large number of various modules and each of these modules is responsible for a special action. For example, in this diagram that, that I'm showing you right now, I have one high performance CPU core, I have another low performance CPU core that sometimes you have a very computational intensive problem to be solved by your chip then you will turn on your high performance CPU core and you will run your program using high performance CPU core but some other times you are just running a very light application so you turn off the high performance CPU core and you run everything on the low performance CPU core then there is a kind of shared memory in which these CPUs and also the other units in the design using this shared memory unit they are sharing the data then for example your chip contains a digital signal processor which is a kind of processor dedicated to doing uh, signal processing tasks and then your system may contain a set of peripherals such as UART, USB, Ethernet and for example a video interface and then your system may contain also A to D and D to A's so as you see your system is a complex ensemble of different IP units now the basic question is how are you going to connect these guys together and what happens if I want to add a new module into this set of modules. So, the very basic important question is connectivity. And to solve this problem, we need a kind of a standard. We need all of our units to talk based on this a standard. So, there should be a kind of unique language through which all of these units are talking and they are obeying the rules of this language. This way, the maintenance of your design will be much easier. 
you can update your design much faster you can add a module much easier why because all of these modules they are talking the same language so you can add another module to the system very easily and it can begin talking to the rest of the system very easily and furthermore you can debug your system easier so whenever you had a problem somewhere in the system you can debug it and you can find the problem much faster finally when you connect these submodules and all of these submodules are obeying a specific way of interfacing to the outside world one very big advantage is that then you can create a library of these modules and then you can reuse them very easily so you do a project the project is finished the library is remaining you go to the next project and when you begin the next project you already have a large library of different IP units that you can insert into your project very easily and you can use them very fast so as I described there's a kind of interface that all of these units will talk to each other through this interface this is a very basic view of how these units are going to get connected uh, to each other in the system so we have a kind of bus and whenever one of these modules wants to talk to another module this talking procedure will be through this bus and all of the modules will actually obey the signaling rules and the signaling standard the way of talking the way of interacting with the outside world as designed by the bus unit so there are a set of rules for example that if a, either one of these modules wants to for example perform a right operation it should obey those rules to be able to do the right operation the interfaces between these modules and the bus for all of the modules is the same and when I design a new module, I will obey these interface rules. So, we have a shared bus. And, or better to say, it is not necessarily shared. We have a bus and all of these units are connected to this bus so that they are able to talk to each other. In practice, the bus is not shared as we will see in future in fact in practice you will see that the important modules in the system which should be able to sustain a high band tra data transfer bandwidth they are connected to their target uh, interfaces using their own dedicated signals so it's not the bus here inside the chip is not necessarily a completely shared medium for maybe low performance modules it can be a shared medium but as we will see in future for high performance modules it can have its own completely dedicated wires assigned to that module so on the chip we have buses and we call them system on chip buses and these buses are in fact protocols ways of signaling through which different modules inside your chip will talk to each other there are a large number of system on chip buses but from this large ensemble of system on chip buses I'm just showing you three or the three one that are most famous in my own idea of course the first one is the IBM core connect IBM core connect was around for a while and Xilinx was using IBM core connect extensively when they had their FPGAs based on the power PC CPU but as of what I have seen recently the core connect is not anymore a really common option to have it as a kind of system on chip bus 
Then we have the wishbone. The wishbone is another bus which is mostly used by open source IP cores which are kept by the open cores repository. So if for example you download one open risk CPU from opencores.org you can see that it open risk CPU is talking wishbone. And then finally ARM has developed a set of system on chip buses and they have extended and enhanced these system on chip buses through time. And I would say Axi is one of them. Here our purpose is to simplify things and to understand them easily. So I'm not going into depths of for example what is underlying Axi. And we really do, don't need that. We don't need to do that. And we don't need to know that. So basically I will say Axi is also one of these bosses. Axi is a kind of protocol, is a kind of way of signaling through which your modules can talk to the outside world. And when you are designing your module, when you are, when you are designing your RTL, you will obey the rules of Axi. You should you will add Axi interfaces to your module so that your module can be used very easily later by other people and by you yourself. As we will see, the entire, for example, Vivado design flow is based on these Axi interfaces. Okay. In order to gain more knowledge about what is Axi, I would say Axi has, in fact, three basic concepts. One, Axi master, Axi a slave, and Axi interconnect. First, I talk about what is an Axi master interface, what is an Axi a slave interface, and then later we will talk about what is an Axi interconnect. Before that, let's make an important definition and that is the definition of transaction. What is a transaction? A transaction is basically an operation through which data is transferred from one point in your chip to another point. For example, data is transferred from the memory inside your chip to one module or vice versa from the module to the memory transactions can be either read transactions or write transactions the module inside your chip that initiates the transaction the module that starts the transaction is called a master the module inside your chip which is the target of the transaction which receives and responds to the transaction is called a slave so for Axi interfaces the story is the same suppose that you have two modules one of them will be an Axi master one of them will be the one who is initiating who is generating the transactions another one will be an axi a slave this is the one that receives the transactions and responds to them for example axi master can be a cpu axi a slave can be a block of memory the cpu initiates read and write transactions to the memory. The memory responds to these read and write transactions. In our block diagram representation, we always represent the Axi master port with a rectangle. And we always represent the Axi slave port with a circle. So here we have one module which contains 
one axon master port. Here we have one module which contains one axon slave port. This module initiates the transactions. The transactions can be either writes or reads. This module responds to the transactions. When we have write transactions, the flow of data will be from this module to this module. When we have read transactions, the flow of data will be from this module to this module. Now, I am showing the same diagram as before, but I want to show you some more information. Whenever an Axi master unit wants to perform a transaction, first he should send a set of commands and a set of initial information about the transaction that is going to happen to the Axi slave. For example, whenever we, the Axi master wants to perform a write transaction or a read transaction, it is necessary that the Axi master sends to the Axi slave the address for this read or write transaction. And then when the Axi slave is performing the transaction and is doing the transaction and is providing the data if it is the read or accepting the data if it is the write then the axi slave should produce the suitable response to the axi master each axi connection between a master an axi master and an axi slave has in fact five basic components first i will call these com each of these components a channel and each channel contains a set of signals in later videos i will show you in detail what which signals exist in each of these channels but for now it is mandatory that you learn the basic channels for each of these Axi master, Axi slave connections. Whenever the Axi master wants to perform a write transaction to the Axi slave, this write operation happens through these three channels. First, the Axi master, through the write address channel, puts the write address, sends the write address to the Axi slave. Then, through the write data channel, Axi master sends the write data to the Axi slave. Finally, the Axi slave, through the write response channel, responses to the master if the write operation is done successfully or not. Now, the read transaction. Whenever the Axi master wants to perform a read from the Axi slave interface. First, it should put the read address, it should send the read address to the Axi slave. This sending operation will happen through the read address channel. <coughs> Whenever the Axi slave wants to respond to a read operation, and wants to provide the read data to the Axi master, it will produce this response through the read response channel. Now the question will be, what if here in this configuration, for example, we had one Axi master but two Axi slaves, or vice versa, we had one Axi slave which needed to be accessed by two Axi masters or two Axi masters which should talk to two Axi slaves. So as you see, one component is missing here between the Axi slave and the Axi master. And that is an Axi interconnect which allows you 
to connect several Axoi masters to several Axoi slaves. We will talk about an Axoi interconnect in the next video. These series of videos are a personal hobby. They are not official. But I would like to thank Professor Luca Benini of University of Bologna and also ETH Zurich and Professor Norbert Wayne of TU Kaiserslautern for the support. Without their support, these videos will never come into existence. Finally, you can always find the latest materials about this course on my personal websites, Green Electrons and Google. Thanks for watching.